Welcome to Paranormal Almanac with your host, Kurt Sam. Welcome to another edition of Paranormal Almanac. And on this edition, let's talk about the paranormal West Virginia. What? You'll find out. Relax. But first, as always, we have shout outs. Now here, I'm going to ask you again, if you're a fan of this podcast, please, please, please don't skip ahead. There's so many people that do not like that I do shout outs for the patrons every episode. Well, one, get like, get used to it because I'm not I'm not getting rid of it. And two, you should be thankful for them. Because if it wasn't for the patrons, you wouldn't have as many episodes of this show. Speaking of, I had a bunch of people say, hey, you haven't done an episode in like two weeks. That's not true. Patrons got two episodes. So, you know, it helps support the show and you get more episodes of a show that you say you like. So it's all win-win. But we got shout-outs going out to... Eugene, Mike G, Tracy, Ryden, Jet, Brenda, Richard, Logan, Lori, Alec, Roger Funk, Karen, Dram, Lori, Rebecca, and Stephen Share. Hey, howdy, hi. Thank you for the letter. Jane and Jennifer. Oh, wait, I've got another person to thank for a letter. Hold on one second. Logan, thank you for the thank you for the awesome card, Logan. Thank you so, so much. Also, I'll get to Tracy's in a second. But thank you, Logan. I, w- I really, really did enjoy that card. That was very cool of you. Thank you so much. And I'll take you up on that when I'm in New York. Uh, anyhow, where was I? Roger Funk? Sure, why not? Karen, Duran, Lori, Rebecca, Aaron, Ann, Stephen Share. That's where I was. Jane Ann, Jennifer, Heather G., your friendly neighborhood skinwalker, Zuzus. What's it? Nico Share and the Mouse. And again, hey, howdy, hi, and thank you for the letters. Absolutely love them. Mark and Tina, Tortuga, Mike from Jersey, Jay Bizzle. Andy, Tracy, there we go. That's the one. Thank you so, so much. First, special shout out. I'll do a special shout out at the end, Tracy, as well. But special shout out to Tracy for just an absolute wonderful, being an awesome person. She's actually doing, well, I don't know, I'll get to that later. I'll get to the what, what she's doing in a minute. But um, special shout out to Tracy. I'll get to the rest in a minute. Virginia Mailman, Tony the Magician, Jason, Vicky, Crow, Lobita Works, Glacier Man, Isabel, Jen, Jen, Stacy, Amber, Tracy, Kelly, Joe, Menace the Beast, Kick-Ass Magic Robot Webcomic, Sandy, Paige, Kausch, Bentman, 666, Scott, Andrea, Melody, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Becca, Jake, Charlotte, and the Beasties. I got it in the first take. Elizabeth, Sherry, hey, howdy, hi, it's been a while. Art, Tim, Art Muffin, that is, Tim, I thought you were going to come and visit me. That's okay, well, next time. Kenneth, Ricky, Ricardo, Alexandra, George, Zozo the Demon, Hayden, Cindy, Ashley, Carrie, Robin, Will, Lauren Mangano, Russell, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Paula, Jerry, Jeff T. Joe, Lawrence, Melissa, Lauren Strawn. Hey, howdy, hi. It's been a while. I got to text you in a minute. Veronica, Autumn, J. Mark, Carolyn, Jade, Nanashi, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson. It's been a while for them, too. I got to hang out with them. Dan, Laura Pitts, and Gamer fans. Okay. Special shout outs to Holden, Holden Yeager, the amazing composer of the theme song you just heard. But always two special shout outs, as always, to Joe Teague and to my boy Stitch. But this special shout out also for Tracy. First, a happy birthday, Tracy shout out. So happy birthday to Tracy. It's just past her birthday, but still counts. And a shout out to Tracy for not only being cool and, you know, sending me some fun stuff from Detroit while she was there. Watch that. She was there. That's right. Special shout out to Tracy for trying to find the treasure. I, uh, I've messaged, I've been so busy, I barely had a chance to message her, but I was, I looked into my theory a little bit more. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a, there's a treasure hunt called The Secret. Go listen to that episode. It was very recent, my past three, four episodes, but maybe, um, where I think I'm onto something, where I have a theory about where one of the treasures from The Secret could be, and it's in Detroit. And the more I look into it, the more Things, coincidences, whatever you want to call them, pop up that make me think, God, I might be right. There might be treasure right there. So um, I messaged her a couple of theories, a couple of things that, you know, I rewatched that um, 
Expedition Unknown episode with Josh Gates. Uh, if you've got time, if you're in the area, you know, coordinate, go to the Facebook fan page and coordinate and see if maybe you could help Tracy to find said treasure. Here's the deal. Whoever finds it is going to be like, is, is the person. So obviously like I gave you all the clues or hopefully all the clues, hopefully they're all there where I think it's at. So I would like a shout out of some kind. And Tracy is, is being so generous to say that she's going to be the person on the street and it would be my, I get to, to turn in for the, uh, for the, the jewel. But I think it's, I think it's a, I think it'll be a, whoever, if she finds it, like I say, if she finds it this weekend, it's her and I, man, she's, she's the one that she deserves it. She deserves all the hard work. She's put, you know, boots on the ground, if you will. So if you're interested and you're in the area in Detroit, not too far away, and you think I might be right, if you think I'm wrong, then obviously don't waste your, don't waste a weekend. But I don't know. The more I look into it, the more it seems like there's a lot of clues that are right there. One of the things that they were talking about, the author was talking about, on, I believe it was the Expedition Unknown. I watched so much stuff about The Secret recently. Um, it could have been one of the YouTube videos or, or, or whatnot about him or, uh, you know, with him is that he said, don't overthink the clues. That's the biggest mistake that people have been making is that they overthink the clues. And if you actually look at the ones, the three that have been found, they didn't overthink the clues. There is some creative cluing going on, creative clues. But if you, once you like, once the guy found like the Boston one, it's, it's straight on. I mean, he, He's like, I know it's generally in this area. They said five spokes or something like that. And he found these five wharfs that took him to the next step. I mean, it was all right there. Just kind of laid out home plate. It was really laid out for him. So don't overthink the clues. I think that's the biggest problem that these people are having is they're making them. And if you read about a bunch of these guys, there's, there's guys that have dedicated far, far, far too much time, um, into looking into it. And I, and man, they're, they're like, and if you look at the way that the sun looked in 1982, when he was probably putting it down here in comparison to the weather that was going on that day, I don't know, man, I think you're overthinking it. I mean, the, the man himself said, don't overthink it, but you know, what do I know? I don't have one in my hands right now. So I might be just talking out of my ass too, but anyhow, let's get right on in special shout out to Tracy though. Thank you so much. I think that's very cool that, uh, you know, if, and again, worst thing that happens is you spend a day on, on, on a beautiful island in Michigan. That's pretty. All righty, let's get right into paranormal news, though. That's right. Welcome to Paranormal News. Um, the first story, there's a lot of paranormal news. I'm not going to probably do them all. Um, whenever I take more than a, a week off, like literally more than like seven days off, there's just a ton that, that gets released. But let me get to what I can. The first one is Defense Drops 10-Page UFO Dossier. Let me, first of all, dossier. First of all, don't read this dossier. It's a waste of your time. Uh, second of all, don't have high hopes about what this dossier says. Because it's, uh, it, look, let me just tell you. It includes 17 defense communications about UFOs and unidentified aerial phenomena created between July and October of 2023. The key message is defense has no particular interest in the subject. Yeah, that right there is enough to make you go, oh, okay, well, even they're not going to tell you anything. This is just just a, another kind of smokescreen to be like, yeah, we, we don't have anything. Even though within a year, like less than a year ago, they said we've got extra extraterrestrial uh, biological entities. We got ETEs, bodies, basically, alien bodies, and we have wreckage. Now they're saying there was no scientific or other compelling reason to continue to devote resources to the recording and investigation of unidentified aerial phenomena. Bullshit. Every week, as you'll see in this week's, how many of these I decide to read, every week there's a dozen UFO sightings, UAP sightings, credible evidence but they still have the absolute gall, the balls on the government to be like, nah, there's nothing there. 
He goes on to say, defense does not have a policy on the reporting of unidentified aerial phenomena by either members of the public or defense members. Defense safe. Also, I must say, I don't know. It's maybe it's an Australian spelling of the word defense, but it's spelled wrong. Defense is spelled wrong. It's spelled with a C and it's driving me absolutely crazy. Maybe that's an Australian way. I don't want to buy. I want to bag on the Australians because they're awesome. So I'll keep reading. Defense does not have a policy on the recording or the port reporting of unidentified aerial phenomena by either members of the public or defense members. Defense safety of flight incidents, including those potentially posed by UAPs, are handled by the Defense Aviation Authority with civilian flight incidents, the purview of the Civil, civil Aviation Authority. So it's a nothing to see here type report. Um, the actual report, it says it's 10 pages. It's really not. I mean... Technically, there are 10 pages if you scroll through, but like, it's like when you remember when you were a kid and you'd write a book report and they're like, it's got to be two pages and you just fill the pages with like big, bold letters and lots of spaces. It's that. So whoever, whoever wrote this had to do a book report the next, this was like their book report that was due the next day. And they're like, oh shit, it's got to be 10 pages. Okay. I can, I'm going to do way more spaces and I'm going to highlight. Oh, I can put a, I can put a logo at the top of this page. It's not 10 pages. Alrighty, up next, Harvard professor claims that UFOs, oops, hold on, I uh, almost had my my ad blocker on to block everything from me. Let's try that again. Harvard professor claims that UFOs could have traveled to Earth via extra dimensions that CERN scientists are trying to unlock. If you go down a rabbit hole about, um, about CERN, and there are a lot of rabbit holes about CERN, one of them is that's the reason that we have so many Mandela effects is that the CERNs basically split them up, split us off into a bunch of uh, parallel dimensions. So when anything ever happens at CERN, everybody goes, Whoa, well, that's what we're trying to do. But here's the deal. CERN scientists are trying to unlock extra dimensions right now. So this isn't like put on your tinfoil hat time. This is what they're actually trying to seek. They're seeking evidence of six extra dimensions. Should we? Kurt here. Let's not. Shit's been bad enough for a long time, and it can all be kind of pointed to CERN anyway. Let's not. Let's not rip the fabric of time. I mean, sure, it would be cool to have John Lennon back, you know, if we rip open a dimension and we're in a parallel universe like Fringe, and all of a sudden John Len- I got a bunch of new John Lennon albums. That's cool. But the bad stuff is there. I don't want to deal with more bad stuff. It says the U.S. government has yet to unravel the mystery sightings, mysterious sightings of UFOs soaring through our skies. But a Harvard professor believes the answer may sit 300 feet below the surface. That's right. Avi Loeb. Love the man. Absolutely love him. Can't wait to interview him again. Known for his efforts to prove we are not alone, his claim that extraterrestrial visitors are traveling through hidden dimensions created by researchers at CERN's Particle Accelerator. The, uh, or the, at least the particle, the, the dimensions that they're trying to find. The accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, the last part, uh, I don't need to go into that. You know what it is. It's a big circle, and they do stuff, and then the atoms go around really fast, and then all of a sudden, the end of uh, Moonraker doesn't have, you know, it, look, I'm not getting into Mandel effects. They make me angry, but you know what I'm saying. Um, anyhow, he goes on to say that... Um, that traveling through extra spatial dimensions would mean the chance of collisions would be much smaller. People getting to basically UFOs getting from one point A to point B would be quicker and easier and faster, and collisions would be smaller and smaller. The, the chance of a collision would be smaller and smaller. So it they talk about how in 2012 they tried to discover the God particle. That's probably when we started having Mandela effects. That's Kurt here. That I added that. Um, but um there is a good chance that he said that these extra dimensions that we're now trying to find are the dimensions that they use to get to Earth. And that's cool. That's terrifyingly cool. Should we be doing that? Again, probably not, and I say no. Alrighty, up next, Paranormal News. Did you guys watch the uh, the eclipse yesterday? I did. I went outside and I watched it for a couple seconds, even though it wasn't, to- you know, in totality in, in California. I still, anything to do with... Anytime, oh God, there's an ad. Anytime that there is something to do with like a SpaceX launch, the actual launch people themselves are cool. Like like launching rockets into space is cool. I'll watch that every time. 
And anytime there's a celestial event like this, and at the end of the month, there's going to be an, um, a comet coming through. But so yesterday, a bunch of people are outside watching the solar eclipse. And in Arlington, Texas, well, they saw more than just an eclipse. Let me see if I can play this, uh, see how crazy the sound is for it. Um, it might be a lot of people talking over it, but this this is news news stories everywhere. This news story is everywhere. When I tried to find news for this episode, it was ninety percent talking about Arlington UFO. What is that? All right. So when that guy said, "What is that?" There is something streaking across the sky in the clouds. Um, come on, get to it. I want to hear... Th There's a spot where you can actually hear the people talking, and all these people are like, whoa, what the hell? Ah, uh, this is a crap version of the video. Um, so I'll find a cleaned up version. I'll throw it on the Facebook fan page because I would like you to see how quickly this thing just streaks across the sky. It's very thin. It's... Um, Maybe cigar shaped, or maybe it's just moving that fast. But it, like I said, there are a ton of videos out there about the Arlington UFO during the eclipse. Let me see if I can find one with a cleaner audio. No, I'll find, don't worry, I'll find one after the episode and I'll throw it up on there. It's definitely worth checking out. I don't know what it is. It could be just the reflection of something behind them in the clouds, like maybe a plane's flying behind them in the clouds. I don't know, but it is bizarre. Um, the crowd gathered in Arlington, Texas to watch the solar eclipse, but ended up seeing more than what they bargained for. That's right. They saw UFOs zipping across the sky. Footage wildly sh widely shared on, sp on social media shows the unknown dark object shaped like a disc or a cigar. Hey, I said that. Moving amongst the clouds. It shoots across the screen, disappearing disappearing beneath the cloud wisp before then emerging again. One person can be heard screaming, whoa, there's something flying through the air. What the F is that? Meanwhile, another shouts, it's aliens, it's aliens. That's the version I'm trying to find. There's a bunch of people talking in the one that I watched initially. Um, they People are saying like, hey, this is, the group, this is the best UFO video ever because it's not fake. There's a ton of versions of it. You can hear genuinely people freaked out like, what the hell is that? So what was it? See if I can get this video to play. Oh, there's a commercial. Hold on. I don't hear anything this time. All right, I'll have to find it after the fact. It is, like I said, it's really neat to watch. Um, even if I can't find the one with clean audio, it's really neat to watch, and it is all over the news right now. But I want to keep moving on. I want to get. I want to keep going here. I want to get to the actual episode itself. Surfboard-shaped UFO film speeding around the moon by NASA's Lunar Orbiter. That's right, another UFO video. This one I'm not as sure about. But um, the object and NASA's orbiter were moving past each other around 7,000 miles per hour. It looks like a blur, but NASA scientists quickly figured out what they had caught. Ooh, this is an update. I didn't. They the last time I read it, they didn't know what the hell they had caught. Um, I thought it was just going to be end up being a computer glitch. But let's find out. Um, while some speculate the sighting was Digital artifact, that's what I thought. Others think it's a UFO. But the American Space Agency later revealed that LRO captured Korea's lunar orbiter, Denuri, as it soared just a few miles away. Oh, interesting. Now, that does make total sense. The Denuri streaked by the LRO about three miles closer to the moon than the NASA spacecraft. That's what gave it that appearance. That makes total sense to me. All right, well, they figured it out. So it's not a UFO anymore. It's an O, So, or I guess it's an FO. So I'm moving on. Up next in paranormal news, Western U.S. residents report the most UFO sightings. What are they actually seeing? And this one's from space.com. It's difficult to explain why we have so many more sightings in the West. There's a lot more um, secret air bases. Not secret air bases, but you know what I mean. There's a lot more military air bases, in my opinion. But they say those of us in the Western United States who have enjoyed vast open spaces may also be more likely to report UFOs, according to a new study. Um, let's see. The study, based on about 98,000 reports over 20 years, is an open-source online data set maintained by the National UFO Research Center, New Fork, 
and it modeled how reported UAP sightings coincide with environmental variables such as light pollution and cloud cover, as well as things like proximity to airports and military installations. The results reveal the majority of reported sightings originate in the western United States, along with a smaller hotspot in the northeastern United States. Now, there's actually a, a map, like a colored map that shows it, and it is exactly, whatever you're picturing, you're, you're right. The, the entire east or west coast um, have like 99 to 95% UFO sightings, and then it gets kind of nothing in the middle because there's not a lot of people there. But over the northeastern, over the New England, there's a ton over there as well. He and his colleagues posit that the large number of sightings in the western U.S. can be partly explained by its wide open spaces and all-year temperate weather, which draw people outside for recreational activities. People are outside and looking skyward. That makes sense to me. Then there have military bases. It goes through all of the military bases. So what are people actually seeing? Let's see. It's... Uh, it states that its uh, new fork does remove obvious hoaxes as well as highlights a small subset of potentially interesting, credible cases. It also removes, oh, good, it removes Starlink. That's good because that's one thing I was gonna, about to say. They said that there's more technology in the sky than ever before. So the question is, what are people actually seeing? It's a tough question to answer, and it's an important one because any uncertainty can be a potential threat to national security. Except for, what, like three stories ago when everybody was saying, like, we don't care. Bullshit. They said, we don't really know at this point why there are fewer sightings in the South. The results are getting, we're getting are supposed are supported by the research, but we could still be wrong too. They're going to continue basically to review all of the stuff, see if they can figure out a timeline and a time frame of all the reports and see if there's any correlation to our uh, corroboration to the reports. I think that's smart. All righty. I'm going to cruise through this next one up next in paranormal news. Here are all the places Bigfoot is reportedly be seen, reportedly to be seen in West Michigan. That's right. West Michigan's becoming a hot spot for Bigfoot. Kent County, Michigan, a lot of them. Ottawa County, Michigan, which I have family members there, a lot of them. Muskegon County, which I've been there many times, a lot of them. Allegan County, I don't know where Allegan County is, to be honest with you. There's only there's a few of them. Ionia County, there's quite a few of those. Barry County, quite a few of them. So if you live in Michigan, don't stop looking for UFOs, but also look around at the ground and you know, try and find Bigfoot. But again, as always, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. It's, it's real easy. Words to live by. This next one comes from two special paramaniacs. Uh, my friends, Rowan and Kevin, they were in New York City uh, for their anniversary. And they're from out here in California, obviously. Well, not obviously, but they are. Um, turns out, there was a Bigfoot sighting in Central Park, and they were actually in Central Park that day, and unfortunately, they didn't end up seeing them, but it was just publicity for the new uh, Bigfoot movie that just came out that I really want to see. So if you saw Bigfoot in Central Park, don't worry, you're not crazy. You saw Bigfoot in Central Park, but it's not real. Alrighty, up next in Paranormal News, supposed Sasquatch sighting near Grand Mound investigated by Bigfoot researchers. Where the hell's Grand Mound? Doesn't really say. Where is this? Boy, it doesn't say where this is. Well, let's keep reading. Maybe we'll find out together. BFRO reported and investigated a recent sighting of a Sasquatch north of Centralia. Still, I have no idea where I'm at. According to one witness who was riding motorcycles with his friends and his three-and-a-half-year-old son, hopefully the son wasn't riding a motorcycle, just on the back of it, the group spotted something running across the ridgetop about a half a mile away. It was very large and human-shaped. There was one colored tan brown moving across a very rugged terrain, making a beeline for the tree line. Beeline for the tree line. The three of them watched the figure for 30 seconds before it went out of sight. It moved so fluently with little arm movement, like, unlike a human running, it was easily 10 feet tall for us to be able to see it from so far away. They said, based on all the descriptions, what you got there is a Bigfoot. Kurt here. I could have told him that a while ago. All righty, with that, that's the end of Paranormal News. I'm going to jump ahead. I'll save the rest for later. Um, let's talk about merch real quick. Head on over to tpublic.com slash paranormal... Oh, wait. tpublic.com slash stores... Oh, I'm screwing it up. tpublic... I got I to gotta, I gotta read it. It's been a... I've been, it's been 10 days. I forgot already. Uh, 
Here we go. tpublic.com slash stores slash paranormal dash almanac. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash paranormal dash almanac for all your paranormal almanac merch. Like I said, it's not just shirts. You can get tank tops and hoodies and crew necks and baseball shirts and wall art and mugs and pillows and totes and tapestries and pins and phone cases and stickers and magnets. You name it, they got it. Hopefully, I've made at least one shirt that you like because there's a lot of styles on there. I, there really are. And if you're a first-time buyer, you get 30% off when you sign up for email and text, which that's a damn good deal. So please check out the merch. It helps the store out quite a bit. Now, before I get to the actual, or before we take a break, I should say, um, you know how I've said many a times, if you're a regular listener, a paramaniac, you know, I've said many a times that, you know, conspiracies just aren't, conspiracy theories, they're just not fun anymore. They're all the bad kind of conspiracies. And frankly, it just makes me sad for the world and people in general. Well, I went to a show on Sunday with a couple of friends of mine It's a show called Randy Feltface. Now, if you don't know who Randy Feltface is, I highly suggest you find out. Go to YouTube or, you know, whatever social media you want, TikTok, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, pick one. Look up Randy Feltface. Watch him. A, absolutely hysterical. It's a puppet, or he's a puppet, not it. Wow, that's weird. He's a puppet. His name's Randy Feltface. He's a comedian. And he was testing out his new show that's just about to go, like, make the rounds. It's called, like, The Banana Factor or something like that. He was just testing it out. But it is a conspiracy that has been sent to me a few times to investigate. And I was actually going to do some investigation and do an episode eventually about, like, you know, more batshit crazy conspiracy theories, like one of those kind of episodes. I can't. I cannot do that conspiracy any justice in comparison to what Randy Feltface did. It was so brilliantly done. And you think the entire time, well, this is just dumb and and batshit crazy, and there's no possible way that this is really a conspiracy. Oh, but it is. Oh, it really is. And I was telling my friends after we got out, I'm like, oh, my God, that's a real thing. And they're like, shut up. And then I showed them, like, on the way home, I was telling them, yeah, it's a real conspiracy, and it's real batshit, it's real crazy, and it's the fun kind. They... He started to mention a couple of the darker parts of the conspiracy, which is why I've never not done it yet. But he did it in such a humor-filled, let's make fun of the, the 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 bad stuff way that it was so brilliantly done. So if you get a chance, Randy, if Randy Feltface is coming to your town, go see it. Especially if it's something about the banana factor or something with banana. Trust me, it's freaking brilliant. It's well worth your time, and the tickets are pretty cheap. All right, with that, let's take, and I don't get paid for this. That was literally just a show that I went to that was just that fantastic, and it was happened to be about something that I was going to do an episode about. With that, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. We are back. Okay, for all those people that complain that it takes like six minutes for him to get into an episode, A, I don't care. You've got, you can fast forward. Just fast forward. It's not hard. B, have you ever listened to Mark Marin? It's like 55 minutes before he gets to an episode. I just gave you a bunch of paranormal news. I consider that part of the episode. So let's let's stop that complaint, if you will. That'd be fantastic. And the another complaint that I would love to have people stop, because I don't understand it, is a lot of people are still giving me bad reviews saying, he doesn't even talk about paranormal. It's all bullshit politics. What? No, it's not. What are you talking about, man? I don't want to talk about politics. That's the last thing I want to talk about. This is my my safe space from the barrage of bullshit politics that I get daily in the news. I'm I you know I need this as much as everybody else. So if you can, if you can leave this show a review, like, comment, subscribe on YouTube. If you if you listen to it on Apple leaving a comment or or leaving a review and and a rating, it actually does help me out. So if you've never done it before, or even if you have, maybe it's been a while, please, for the love of God, please give me a nice review because the amount of bad reviews are really destroying the audience that I have for this show. 
And I don't understand why, especially the one about like, all I talk about is politics. That's it. I, I'm not going to talk about, I promise you, I'm not going to talk about politics any more than what I just said a second ago, the word politics. I'm not going to talk about politics at all on this episode. It's a safe space. Okay, everybody. All right. With that, we are back. And you know what? You might be thinking, well, why are you doing an episode on West Virginia? Sure, everyone knows about Mothman and his beautiful, squats-filled, shiny metal ass. And I've already done an episode about Flatwood Monsters, but West Virginia, for some strange reason, which I can't fathom or figure out, has even more spooky shit in it than just about any state, really. So I figured, I just want to sit down and relax and talk about West Virginia. What is it? It's why it's West Virginia. It's not even a full Virginia. It's a West Virginia. It's not even a big state. But man, you guys figured out some way to pack a lot of shit in there. So the first one we got to talk about is Sheep Squatch. Now, look, I was amazed when I tried to look through all the old episode um, outlines that I do. And I couldn't find any episode about about Sheep Squatch. I'm sure it's been, I'm sure I've mentioned it on an old episode, but it's never really been kind of like, you know, deep dived into like I'll do now. Um, and it really surprises me that I can go almost 300 episodes and not talk about something called Sheep Squatch in depth. Um, I'm going to say, though, that the first account that I can find about Sheep Squatch Take it with a grain of salt because, well, there's no way to confirm this is a real sighting. For this, we go back to 1929 when coal miner Frank Kozel reported seeing a thing while walking to his home in Fairmont one night. It was in July. He was walking through the woods on Morgan's Ridge. Let me pause right there. I, I do know he existed. There's records online that show that Frank Kozel existed. He was born in 1893 in some Croatian province of Dalmatia or something, which that can't be a real place. But, um, well, I can prove it right now. Let me, let me, Dalmatia. It's not going to give me a dog. It's a narrow belt stretch from the island of Rab in the North Bay of Kotor in the south. All of this sounds so like I just pulled it out of Game of Thrones. But I swear to you, Dalmatia is a real place. Frank Kozel's a real person. He moved to the United States in 1914. They know that from the census. By 1920, he was living in a boarding house in Benwood, West Virginia. Within a few years from that, he moved to Fairmont, which is where the story takes place, where he met and married... Beatrice Dukic uh, then moved into her family home, started working at the Consolidated Coal Company's Jordan 93 Mine, which is just north of Rikes, Rivesville, Rivesville, Rivesville in West Virginia. So he exists. That part I can, I've done the research on. What I'm trying to say is how his story got out, which you'll hear about in a second. That's why I'm saying keep this like a grain of salt with this one. Anyhow. Legend says that Frank had just ended an 11-hour shift at the Jordan 93 mine and began his walk home. It was a six and a half mile walk that would take him about two hours to complete, so he chose to go uh, to avoid the unshaded road in favor of a shortcut through the woods on Morgan's, Morgan's Ridge. Kurt here, if you want to see a sheep squatch, Morgan's Ridge is still your place to go. Now, partway through his walk home, he says that uh, he basically encountered a beast about the size of a large dog with white hair, a bushy tail, but the most important part was very sharp teeth. He said before he could react, the animal pounced on him, and though he swung at it with his lunchbox, he said he couldn't make contact. He said he he attempted to escape the creature by running away, but it continued to attack and bite him. Now, as he reached the outskirts of a nearby cemetery, that seems like a bad place to feel safe, Um, He said that the animal stopped and then ran off or disappeared. Depending on where you get the story, it's very hard to tell if it just disappeared or if he meant like he turned around and and it was gone. Um, He said that uh, he was amazed to discover that even though he had been bitten repeatedly, he said there were no injuries from the attack. In fact, there were no marks whatsoever on him. So he runs home. I don't blame him. 
Um, and he said he'll never take that shortcut home from the mine again. But here's the thing. He didn't call it a sheep squatch. He called it a white thing, which I'm sorry. I know he spent all day in a mine, probably breathing in fumes, probably not the most well-educated man on, uh, you know, in 1920, but the best name you can come up with after seeing a sheep squatch is white thing. That's just weak. What attacked, what attacked you? It was a white thing. We're going to need more here, Frank. What it look like, buddy? Give me, oh, it's got teeth. Okay. See, we got more than just a white thing. You're never going to find it with that description. But from here, things get murky. A lot of sources say that he told the whole town and that he said, yeah, I'm never going to walk that route again. It was on Morgan's Ridge. And the whole town supposedly started seeing sheep squatch as well. But I can't verify any of that. It does seem that decades later, his daughter would tell anyone that wrote all about his incident. Like if you were a writer at all, she'd be like, oh, I got it. My dad saw this white thing. And let me tell you a better story than he can tell you because he doesn't have a lot of details. Um, And that does seem to be where a lot of the details about Sheep Squatch come from. And I'm talking a lot of details. This is where her story or her version of the story or decades later when people would start to write about uh, Sheep Squatch is where all of a sudden it would include that uh, Sheep Squatch tears apart animals in the woods or livestock. Like, you know, like all of a sudden sheep squatch is a predator that it would charge people, but never kill them. That hunters and farmers would often hear terrifying screams in the middle of the night that was said to come from sheep squatch. And according to the daughter, that when the stories got out, that teens in the town began, like, they're like, oh, crap, we got a sheep squatch? And they tried to start scaring people. And that tried. They did. They went out in abundance. The teens in the 1920s didn't love a lot going for them in this small town. They decided to be sheep squatch at night. They're banging on the outside of houses and barns and, and built, like, tin buildings. They were screaming to scare neighbors and farmers. But it does seem like even though a group of teens admitted to being the cause of a few sightings or reports of sheep squatch years later, they never said it was always them all the time. They just said that after that initial sighting and they heard about the details, they thought it would be fun to, to go out there and scare people. So it does seem like Frank genuinely saw something, genuinely saw something. And again, it's kind of murky, but it seems like the town then started seeing sheep squatch as well. And they did find dead livestock, but it's it's in the woods. I would assume that finding live, livestock killed by an animal, a wild animal, would be a fairly regular thing in the woods of, of West Virginia. But anyhow, from there, we go to the first published stories of sheep squatch. They're from a book called The Telltale Lilac Bush which is a collection of West Virginia folklore by Ruth Ann Music. It was published in 1965. Now, one of the stories is entitled The White Thing. So, yeah, it's going to be about Frank's thing. But it's not about Frank's thing. It's actually about a woman who encountered a white beast while traveling home from church on horseback. This one I, I can't verify. They don't really talk about, like, the woman's name or anything like that. I can't go into the history, but I'll continue with what the story says. So this white thing, this this beast, charged to the woman, then retreated back into the trees after she fled on her horse. Now, once she got home, uh, the woman left her horse outside and went into the house. But the next morning, she found her horse dead with most of the flesh torn from the horse's bones. Creepy, terrible story. I like horses. That's bad. Uh, Then there's nothing concrete online, so we go to the next batch of sightings, which are basically from the 90s, the 1990s, that is. Not even like, I know the first one's 1920s, but like 70 years of not a lot of sheep squatch that I can find online. But in the 90s, there were a bunch of uh, sheep squatch sightings. Ooh, that's tough to say. Sheep squatch sightings. Uh, They all describe sheep squatch as having a large, furry, or woolly white creature on all fours, but sometimes bipedal. Sightings report that the creature has a dog-like head, but with the goat or ram-like horns and sharp teeth and claws. Now, these sheep squatch sightings 
stated that it ran from people. But then it seems to get more and more aggressive over time. And then investigators said that given the location of the sightings, Sheep Squatch is from the TNT area, which might sound familiar to you because that's the same area as Mothman. All right. There's been even more recent sightings. They all have appeared to have been or originated in Boone County, Putnam County, and Mason County. So Sheep Squatch does seem to get around, but it does stay all in West Virginia. Now, this leads me to what something some people think are a completely different cryptid, but it might not be. It leads us to white things, which are also known as devil dogs. Now, again, I it, it may or may not be Sheep Squatch. I don't know. I've never seen one. There are These are seen in numbers, though, unlike the solitary Sheep Squatch, but it also might make up, might be the reason why there were, if you believe the accounts from the townsfolk, that all of a sudden they started seeing sheep squatch everywhere. It might make it a little bit more reasonable as there's a population of these things. Uh, anyhow, these white things are devil dogs. They're said to inhabit uh, isolated woods in the areas of the Appalachia. It's, oh, is that how you say it? Appalachian? Appala- I think it's Appalachia. I think I said it right. And usually have a dog-like appearance or said to resemble bears, but they always have long, shaggy white fur or hair. They're said to move quickly on both two legs and four legs, and that these are all aggressive towards other animals and people. They're said to make terrifying noises. So there's a lot of correlation between the... The description, not Frank's terrible description, but people's description of sheep squatch and these white things are the devil dogs. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's another here's another thing about like the same kind of thing about sheep squatch, which makes me think that these white things are just that. Um, just like sheep squatch, human victims of attacks say the attacks feel real and painful, but they're left with no visible wounds or injuries. And the creatures themselves disappear right after attacking. They all mention these giant fangs. They all say it's a terrifying, real, painful bite or attack. Yet there is no marks on them when this thing disappears and they have a chance to look themselves over. They say that uh, most attacks occurred on the mountain range that traverses. Oh, I was going to look this up. Manan, Mananang, Manan, Manangalia, Manangalia. Let's look it up. Let's list it up. Let's look it up. I don't want to screw that one up. All right. Here we go. Ready, people? Don't. Yeah. Come on. Monangalia. Monangalia. See? I would have got it wrong. Monangalia. So it's a mountain range that traverses Monangalia and Marion counties. And again, it's known as Morgan's Ridge. So again, the exact same area that Sheep Squatch was in, now they're finding the white things. Now, I could find an article. uh, I did find an article about white things. So here's one small article. I won't read the whole thing. That uh, white creatures are well known to the mountain folk West Virginia. Like black mystery dogs, they roam isolated in wooded areas. They appear in various shapes, impossibly large dogs, lion-like, but it was stark white with long, shaggy, shaggy hair. White things are described also as resembling wolves, bears, cows, and even huge badgers, but they're always covered with long, shaggy, snow white, or dirty white hair, and they also ha- also often have immense jaws and fangs. They move at lightning speed, sometimes on two legs rather than four. Sometimes they seem to have too many legs. Their chilling screams sound like a woman being murdered. Whatever they are, they are bloodthirsty and attack without provocation. The attacks are so real that people actually feel the beast's fangs tearing into their flesh. But when the attack is over and the shock, they are shocked to find not a mark on their body. However, the beast does rip apart animals in the fashion of a werewolf, tearing out their throats and mutilating their bodies and leaving the corpse bloodless without a trace of blood around. Like all mysterious creatures, there are variations and descriptions of white things and even labels. Some of the white mystery beings are called white devils, for they have red eyes and long, sharp claws and are able to walk upright and um, run upright. Some of these beasts have a connection to the cemeteries, not an aversion, and thus are death omen creatures. The article, I'm going to skip ahead. 
Uh, a mysterious white creature was seen in July of 1973 in the TNT area of Point Pleasant, the epicenter of the Mothman sightings during the 66-67 wave. This creature, however, looked nothing like Mothman. Um, in 1994, a 28-year-old man said that he was uh, seven years old at the time. He was riding a car with family members. Um, the witness described the thing as mostly white, no wings with real thick, shaggy hair. No face was seen, but the head was about three feet wide. The creature appeared suddenly alongside the car and floated through the air, following them for a few, min few minutes at about 65 miles an hour. Uh, skip ahead, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. In Cherokee lore, the sudden appearance of a white wolf heralds a magic premature death. Over time, the white wolf becomes a white dog in the Appalachian lore. The dog is large and powerful in build, handsome creature, despite hair that is somewhat matted and unkempt, shows up in roads, follows people's homes, uh, sits at the distance from dwellings as though waiting for someone. The white dog does indeed wait not for a friend or a lost owner, but for a death. Um, but uh, 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 let's skip ahead. Dog is invisible to some people, not to others. Once the white dog appears, the person is marked for death and dies tragically within a few days or weeks. Okay, here's the thing. That was not the case with any of the people that sh that saw Sheep Squatch. There was nobody that died within a few days or just two weeks. So that is definitely more of the Cherokee legend. Skip ahead some more. I caught a glimpse of one of these driving through Pocahontas County, West Virginia last year. It reminded me of a picture I seen of a starving polar bear. I'm fairly certain it was just a, just a hallucination, though, as I had been driving for eight hours at that point. But these guys are actually supposed to be hallucinations. Makes you wonder why West Virginians have been vividly hallucinating about white animals since before West Virginia even existed. Kurt here, eight hours driving is not that long. I've done that stretch quite a many, quite a few times. Um, let's skip ahead here. Oh, here I thought was kind of neat in this article. There's a theory online from an eyewitness that says, does this area have seismic activity? As a former paranormal researcher, it was my job to professionally prove that normal explanations didn't cover it first and foremost. Now, I've never been to the Virginias at all, but if there is seismic activity in the region, perhaps the areas produce infrasound at a megahertz that affects the human mind to create visual hallucinations. Kurt here, cool. I like your theory. I like your, your thought process, but it wouldn't give everybody the exact same hallucination. That's not how infrasound works, but still neat theory. Um, all righty. Anyhow, so yeah, that's just a taste of West Virginia, what it has to offer. Again, are they all sheep squatch? Are all white things and devil dogs and sheep squatches the same or cousins or completely different? Who knows? So let's move on to the next one on this list. It's the Snarly Yow. Now, the Snarly Yow seems to be a ghost dog that's seen all over West Virginia. One report says a man walking along the road near the curve he heard a dog run up beside him. He reached down to pat the dog, but nothing was felt or seen. Yet, he, he distinctly heard the dog panting. He says he walked faster. He was a little scared, so he walked faster and heard the dog also increase its pace. Then the sound of the animal ceased as he rounded the curve. That's a pretty bold thing. If you're walking, I'm, you're on a road, but still, there's not anybody around. If you're walking, you hear a dog run up beside you. First things first, I would look down. Is this a friendly dog? Is this a dog that's going to eat my face? Like real dogs I'm talking here. And if it's a friendly dog, then yeah, I'm going to reach down and pat that dog. You got to pat that dog. But you you just instinctively, like, ooh, I hear a dog. I'm going to reach down to pet that dog. That's a bold move, dude. I wouldn't recommend it. You're going to lose fingers that way. Um, this The Snarly Yow has also been reported for a while, too, because I found a report from the early 1900s that say, Around the turn of the century, a beast resembling a huge dog with large paws and an ugly red mouth, Kurt here, don't kink shame, don't fucking body shame this dog, was known to exist on South Mountain, east of Hagerstown, Maryland. At Turner's Gap, the site of the 1862 battle near where the midnight battle was supposed to have happened. I have no idea what any of that means. It says that hundreds of people saw the dog and horses particularly were afraid of the strange animal. The dog would suddenly appear on the National Pike, now alternate Route 40, blocking the road. Now, without inflicting any damage with its vicious-looking teeth, it would confront travelers, then disappear before astonished men and women. Kurt here, let me pause by saying, this makes it sound like it's like uh, the same thing that Sheep Squatch would do, where it would take a bite out of you and then nothing would happen. That's not the case. 
Snarly Yow, at the most, snarls. So that's where the snarly part comes from. I have no idea what a yow is. You know what? Let's look it up. What the hell's a yow? Let's look up a yow. A yow used to express pain or shock. That doesn't help me. Um, but what is what is a yow? This this does not help me. I don't know where the, the term yow from snarly now yet. Yeah, snarly yow comes from, but. Uh, let's see, we can go to another report in 1882 when Madeline Vinton Dahlgren wrote a book called South, Ma- South Mountain Magic. And it has a bit in there about the Snarly Yow. One night about 10 o'clock as he was returning from the village of Boonesboro, whither he had gone to make some little purchases for his family, he encountered the black dog. It was clear starlight and the ungainly form of the beast could, distinctly, could be distinctly traced. It was black and bigger than any dog he'd ever seen. And as he came nearer, the dog, the object intercepted him and stood guarding the road in such a way as to forbid his crossing. So he, so to use his own expression, he fit him. That is nothing daunted. He fought at him. He fit him. Fit him must mean he started fighting this dog. Dick move. But to his confusion, as the creature was attacked, it grew longer and presently seemed to extend across the road, making no noise but showing a very wide and very ugly-looking red mouth, while all the time the thick and heavy blows rained down upon it. Fuck this guy. The sinewy arm of the woodsman met with no resistance, but rather seemed to beat the air. Presently, the still-lengthening shadow passed onward, and then the man, not a little flurried at the strange nature of the vision, went home, nor did he receive the least bodily harm from this ominous combat. No, it's not a combat. You're being a dick. You saw a ghost dog, and you just started wailing on it? (sighs) All right, the next reliable, I guess, sighting. That one happened in the summer of 1975. A guy named Will, or William, said he was coming home when he saw the snarly yow. He said it was black, much bigger than any dog he'd ever seen. As he came closer, the animal moved to the center of the National Pike and blocked his way, just like that dude from the 1882. So he stayed a bit away, and he tried to scare it off the path, by throwing small rocks and sticks at it and, um, you know, getting big and screaming, all the shit you're supposed to do for an animal. He said he noticed that the small rocks went right through the dog as he threw them, like a ghost dog, like it went through them. He said the dog snarled at him, then just walked away and vanished. So here's the deal. All the sightings are related to the National Pike Trails. One dickhead hunter said he saw the snarly yow and just said, fuck it, and just started shooting at it. He said he shot at it several times. You, you all know what I'm going to say. And the bullets went right through it, so he just ran away scared. Then there's another sighting that sounds a little too made up, like when a, this, this one, I don't, this one's big time grain of salt. Um, a mountain man named Big Joe was out riding the trail on horseback when he saw it. The dog started running before the horse, so he chased it. He said it was kicking up dirt and gravel, but then it suddenly vanished. That's it. That's his entire, that's, that's Big Joe's entire story. Um, there is one story from the 1800s I can't verify about a guy that got drunk in Boonesboro. He became so rowdy that the law tried to arrest him, but he just ran and got on his horse and rode off. But, yep, Snarly Yow ran out in front of the horse on the trail, throwing him off, breaking his shoulder. So he's thrown from the horse, broke his shoulder. He says that as he laid there, he saw the dog just vanish. It's another story about a minister returning along the road after holding an evening prayer in the in the uh, church near Glendale. He claimed to have seen the dog on several occasions, but didn't throw anything at it, didn't try to shoot it. Then there's the tons of reports of people seeing a black dog and throwing bricks and stones at it to see the stuff go through the ghost dog and it just walks away. Kurt here. How about you stop throwing shit at an obviously harmless ghost dog? Snarly Yow? Never done anything. The most it does is it blocks your road for a minute and then snarls at you a little bit. That's it. It's probably snarling at you because no one's gone up and pet the damn thing. Because that's the first thing I would do. I'd be like, oh, snarly, yeah, I got to get, I got to pet that dog. Then there's this uh, unverified, horrible story about a bunch of people driving in the area when they hit a dog with their car. They said they heard the thud and felt it, quote, crush underneath the car. Good Lord, I hate this story. Thankfully, though, when they stopped, there was no dog or anything under the car. 
Then they saw about 50 feet behind them a huge black dog standing on the road glaring at them. The dog bared its teeth as if in defiance and then vanished before their eyes. Can people stop hurting this ghost dog? I want to go there. I just want to go to West Virginia and adopt the Snarly Yow. That's my new goal. Someone, it doesn't have to be me. Someone please go and adopt the Snarly Yow. Bring him treats. Let's let's stop with the hitting him with cars and stuff. Uh, here's a comment from one of the articles I found online about the Snarly, Star, Snarly Yow. I talked to a lady where I used to work who claims to have seen a ghost dog in the same area as a girl when she was a little girl. Uh, she was a Zittles, Zittlestown native. That can't be real. She was 15 years old at the time. She said she was with her 16-year-old cousin near her home on Alt 40 at the intersection of Zittlestown's Ro- Zittlestown Road. It was just after dark. They both heard a noise, looked, and thought they saw a headless, white, translucent dog walk by with a chain collar around its neck. The noise with the chain was the chain dragging on the road, making a clinking sound. Both girls briefly discussed what they saw and ran away scared. This incident occurred in about 1962. Um, but here's the big deal. That sounds nothing like any other description of the Snarly out. It just seems like she saw another ghost dog. Maybe there's a bunch of ghost dogs in the area. Other sites say that eyewitnesses saw it standing on its hind legs, and they said it's similar to the tales of old German settlers from that area, but... I can't really find anything about that either. I really wanted to find stuff about that. A producer for a local cable company was in the area shooting footage for a show about local legends. He had several unexplained things happen to him in the area. In his word, in his words, in the first one, I and another crew member who were just preparing to begin an early morning shoot at the inn were startled by a strange noise that sounded like the howl of a werewolf echoing through the top of the mountains. It was a sound I had never heard before or since. All right. Still doesn't sound like the snarly, snarly yow to me. Uh, apparently, there's a Civil War plaque located on the road near Boonesboro, Maryland for the Battle of South Mountain, but also on that display is a sidebar that reads, Beware of the Snarly Yow. Yeah, I don't agree with that beware of the Snarly Yow. Be more like beware of people because they throw shit or shoot at or drive their cars over a completely innocent Snarly Yow. I don't like it. Um, All right, with that, let's move on. Let's go to the agua. And no, I'm not saying water in Spanish. It's agua, not agua. All right, so the agua, O-G-U-A, not to be confused with agua, A-G-U-A, is also known as the Rivesville or Rivesville monster or the Holt monster. Kurt here, yeah, not a monster. All right, look, it's basically a big-ass turtle, a big-ass alligator snapping turtle. Now, from the, it seems to be, In the areas of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, also seen in Ohio, Allegheny, and the Monongalia, whatever it was, rivers. So it seems like there's more than one aguas here. But how big is this snapping alligator turtle? Well, it's 20 feet long and said to weigh 500 pounds. Let me repeat that. Picture a turtle. Even if you've ever if you've ever seen a snapping turtle, they're kind of assholes anyway. But picture a snapping turtle. Now picture it 20 feet long, weighing 500 pounds. They say the agua is a brownish color and does, you know, everything that snapping turtles do, which again, in case you don't know, is basically just being a big asshole of a turtle. Uh, early reports that say some eyewitnesses thought it had two heads, but I don't know, 99.9% of the reports that I found are just like, oh my God, this turtle's the size of a bus. And Gamera's an asshole, and it's in West Virginia. Um, It's just a giant fucking turtle. It's mostly seen in water, but eyewitnesses have seen it on land. Here's the fun part. While it's on land, it's crushing deer whole. That's right. So deer come down to the edge of the the lake or the river to the water to to drink. And next thing you know, 20-foot-long, 500-pound snapping turtle is crushing them whole. Now, the Agua was first reported back in 1745. Uh, It was uh, reported by a family living in Holt, West Virginia. According to the legend, I say legend because I can't really find out more about them, a 12-year-old boy was allegedly dragged into the Mananagalia River while fishing on October 22nd. 
Witnesses describe the attacking animal as a turtle larger than a bear in size. That's not 20 feet long, but still, big-ass turtle. Um, then, the daughter of the Nichols family woke to the sounds of something, this is a different family, woke to the sounds of something she described as, quote, larger than a sow rubbing against their cabin several days later. The family, their neighbors, the Taylors, they chose to leave the area um, because of the agua, uh, and they said that uh, while fishing with his family, that boy, that first boy, was never seen again. So, yeah, that sucks. 12-year-old boy dragged into the river, probably crushed and eaten by an asshole turtle, giant turtle. Uh, Native tribes in the area had long known about the large beast living within the river, and they apparently told European settlers, you know, in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, hey, there's this giant fucking, don't go near that water. It's got a big-ass beast living in it. And then they'd be like, don't go too close to the edge of the water. There's a large freaking turtle. And then they'd be like, stop shooting at us. We're trying to help you. And then finally they were like, you know what? Screw it. Go in the water. Go see what happened. You should go fishing. And now your 12-year-old boy got eaten by a giant turtle? Well, who could have guessed that? Now, the next account of the agua is that from a young man staying at Fort Harmer, near present-day Marietta, uh, Marietta, Ohio, where the Ohio River uh, meets the Muskegum, Muskingum, Muskingum, I don't know. Uh, he wrote in a letter to his parents um, that an animal in this country which excites the imagination of all who have the, who've had the opportunity to view it. The animal spent the day in the river, but at night would lie in deer paths undiscovered at night behind an old stump until the deer, unaware of its enemy, passed over him. Then the predator immediately seized the deer by entangling him in his tail, which is 15 feet in length, before drawing him to the water where he drowns and devours them. Uh, according to the letter's author, men stationed at the fort had even managed to club such an animal to death and found it to have two heads and weigh 444 pounds. Again, problem here is, what happened to the body? It's a turtle. There should be a giant freaking turtle shell around there somewhere. Uh, the next reported sighting was from John White, who said that he was at a meeting of the river with Paw Paw Creek in the town of Rivesdale or, Rives, or Rivesville or Ribsville, where he saw small waves coming ashore, following shortly thereafter by the sight of fish swimming away from the river towards the mouth of the creek. Then, 30 feet from where he sat, a fin that he estimated at at least 6 to 8 feet in height appeared out of the water. So, obviously, he runs away from the river's edge, and he says that's when he saw a glimpse of a long reptilian tail and the mass it was attached to as it swept out and then back into the water. He described a turtle. He said it was a giant freaking turtle. Then, next sighting, May 15, 1983, the Fairmount Times uh, reported whites and other fishermen's encounters on the river, writing that the monster that has been frightening local fishermen is said to be at least 20 feet long, reddish-brown in color, Serpent-like head, mouth lined with razor-sharp teeth, and a long, flat tail. Kurt here, that is the worst description of a snapping turtle ever. You missed the big turtle shell part of the turtle. Now, according to the Times, the animals most likely came up the river from the Gulf of Mexico, but old-timers say it's agua. Whatever it was, it apparently didn't attack anyone. Local jeweler George Cochran reported that, quote, it did not trouble him. Okay, that dude's pretty badass. I would trouble the shit out of me. Um, but he did say that he refuses to ever again fish at the river and where the river meets the creek. Okay, so it did trouble you. You trying to be cool like, oh, I don't care. It didn't trouble me. Hey, you want to go fishing down there? Fuck no, I don't want to go fishing. There's a giant goddamn turtle. What's wrong with you, man? Yeah, it did bother you. Since then, the reports of the Agua have been made all around Marion County. Now, there's one author that did a lot of work about the Agua online. He thinks that it was all just lore to scare away settlers done by the Native Americans. Kurt here, I hope it was, and good on you. Good job. Why not? Uh, but in a 1969 history of Marion County titled Now and Long Ago, he said the Agua was altogether a mystical beast, first used by the Indians as a threat against all white people, then used later by the white people, especially the Indian traders, soldiers, and earlier visitors in the Western wilderness to impress the folks back home. Basically, he was saying, look, it's a tall tale that people love to tell because it's cool. It's a big monster. You know, look, there's a reason Godzilla movies are keep, keep getting made and King Kong movies keep getting made. People love seeing giant versions of animals. 
And he's saying that that's all this thing really is. And in the same book, he talks about an account from the uncommon animal, as he describes it, in the late 1700s by a youth stationed at Fort Hammer. That's that letter that I told you about in uh, a little bit ago. Um, he he says that 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 it. Um, he goes in a little bit more detail about this kid's letter. He says it lives in a large muddy bank where we can find no bottom. It resembles a turtle. And it's called Agua. And now another author thinks that it's not a turtle. And um, he thinks that it's whatever it is, it's moved upstream to Pennsylvania and it's called the Monongi. Now the Monongi, this is going to get batshit crazy. If you already think this is batshit crazy, hold on. Sit back for a second. So another author, let let me start this again. Another author thinks it's not a turtle, thinks it's moved upstream to Pennsylvania. It's called the Monongi. And the Monongi has been lurking in the river since French and Indian War, since the French Indian War. And the Monongi is half man and half fish. Why does he think that? No one's ever reported it looking like that. Kurt here, no freaking clue. Why the hell this one guy is like, nah, you're all wrong. It's been there since the French Indian War. It's half man, it's half fish. It's basically a merman that doesn't, you know, it's being poorly described. No, I'm sorry. Screw you and your Monongi. All righty. Uh, in 2015, an article that talked about old records from the period chronicled skirmishes between British soldiers and, quote, bizarre creatures from the river. Local tribes had named the creature Monongi after the river, he said. Kurt here, I can't find anything about this. He said there was a rash of sightings of the Monongi beginning in the early 1930s and lasting through the end of the 1950s. Sightings were reported weekly, and the Pittsburgh Police Department rep- responded by creating a task force specifically to deal with this aquatic creature, half man, half fish. Kurt here, nothing, nothing. The author says that in 2003, photos of Monongi were taken from a fishing boat. They appeared online, but were mysteriously removed and never to be seen again. He said the area is renowned for its strange history, Bigfoot sightings, giant skeletons found in the 1800s, and even a strange plant-like creature named Vegetable Man who was sighted in the woods near Ribsville, Rivesville in 1968. All right, reminder to myself, I need to do an episode about Vegetable Man. Kurt here, I'm going to sell it right now. I bet you money I can't find out crap about Vegetable Man. So, here's the question. Is there a giant turtle still alive to this day? Yeah, probably. Is it more plausible than Vegetable Man? I haven't done any research yet, but I'm going to say, oh, hell yeah. That that author, he, I think he was doing some drugs. I'm just going to throw that out there because it doesn't sound like the turtle that everybody's been talking about up until that point. Um, Yeah, so there we go. We got uh, scary sheep squatch. We got ghost dogs. We got giant turtles. Well, what other weird shit is in West Virginia? How about... The Grafton Monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know. Not a monster. Okay, so for this one, we don't go as far back, but we do go back to June 18th, 1964, when the Grafton Sentinel reported twice about the Grafton Monster. Now, the paper reported that teenagers were on the Riverside Drive near the stone quarry hunting for the creature. So we can all assume it had been sighted before there. The teenagers went there to try and see this creature that was sighted in this area. Anyhow, the teenagers described what had been told to them, a nine-foot-tall white creature with no discernible head. So apparently a bunch of teenagers had seen it numerous times, and even though the police weren't taking them seriously, man, this newspaper did. The article said that a similar creature had been seen in Michigan a week earlier. The tale is even embellished with the theory that the creature was first sighted in Morgantown area and arrived in Riverside area via the Mon- Monongagalia, whatever, and Tigart Rivers. All right, so this paper loves to talk about the Grafton monster. The next day, on June 19, 1964, the paper, the paper then reported even more teenagers had joined in the hunt. Then, even more articles and interviews detailing other sightings started happening that same summer. They were written about it again and again and again. My guess is it was a slow news cycle in Grafton. 
Then, guess what happened? Not much, actually. Um, The the sightings basically just stopped. Crap. All right. I I, got to go back to the articles, I guess. So let's go into the articles a little bit more detail. The Grafton monster, also known as the Beast of Grafton, is a large humanoid cryptid that is said to stalk the forests outside of Grafton, West Virginia. The monster was huge, had no visible head, had slick seal-like skin, and the creature was nine feet tall and four feet wide. All right, that's bigger than I was picturing it up until that point. It goes on to say, June 16th, 1964, around 11 p.m., Robert Cockrell, a reporter for the Grafton Sentinel newspaper, was driving along the Tigart River on Route 119, known as Riverside Drive, on his way home from work. There, he suddenly encountered a large white creature on the right-hand side of the road, which was the side that the Tigart River was located on. The creature was lumbering around the side of the road while a low whistling noise was being emitted from further away in the direction of the river. That's reported a couple of times and very weird. Sorry, I had a hiccup. Uh, That's reported a bunch of times. It's very weird. It does make a lot of people think that the Grafton monster was actually an alien because of that whistling sound and either in one direction or from all around you. If you saw the Grafton monster, chances are you heard that weird whistling sound. Um, He was able to see that the creature was very large and appeared to be made entirely of muscle. Ooh, it's muscly. It's also had white seal-like fur and disturbingly didn't didn't appear to have a visible head. The creature moved quickly out of view and upon realizing the white obstruction was a living creature, he said he accelerated down the road until he reached home and probably pissed himself. Uh, Once home, he called two of his friends, Jerry Morse and Jim Mouser. He told the sighting to them and asked them to come with him to the location of the sighting in order to investigate it further. They got there, and they said that they were all they were able to find was trampled grass, but a low whistling sound that seemed to follow them around the site. Eh, whistling part's weird. So the next day at work, Cockrell goes to his editor of the Grafton Sentinel and says, "Like, look, we gotta tell, we gotta tell these stories." He said that the editor didn't take him serious, but um, let him write the article. He assumed nothing more would come from his sighting after that point, but then um, all these people were, you know, going around town saying, did you read the newspaper about the monster? This monster is out there. I don't know why I'm doing that accent. I'm sure they don't have it. Uh, In a very short time, there was a monster hunting party that was formed, predominantly made up of local teens armed with baseball bats or whatever they could find, he says. These roving groups of teens scoured Riverside Drive near where he saw the the creature. And then guess what? They started to see the Grafton monster too. Um, It goes on and on. Basically what I already told you. Um, All in all, about 20 sightings were reported from this monster hunt, all written about by him. Uh, Let's see. Here's a couple of the uh, interviews with people, eyewitnesses from the newspaper. I've seen the creature called the Grafton Monster several times. When I was a young man, it was very real. My first encounter, I was with my father cutting wood. We had finished and we were loading the truck. When our two dogs started barking, we stood there and listened. Something was walking, getting closer. My dad told me to get the gun from the cab. He carried a double barrel, 10 gauge with zero zero buckshot. I don't know. It's a shotgun. Whatever it had picked up, whatever it was, it picked up its pace and continued towards us. All we knew for sure, it was big and wasn't scared of us, the dogs, or the chainsaws. It stopped about 50 to 55 yards from us in the trees, and, the, and everything went quiet. My dad pulled both hammers back and stood in front of me, told me to be ready. The next thing that happened, I'll never forget. It stepped out, looked at us. Kurt here, it doesn't have a head. What did it look at you with? Took three strides in our direction, turned and walked back into the tree line. That was my first sighting of the beast, and I'll never forget it. My second encounter was about two months later at night, fishing alone. I spotted him on the opposite bank, and I got the hell out of the area. I saw the monster near the river early in the morning. It saw me and instantly froze. It did not move. I was fishing at the time and left all my gear there and started to run away. As I ran, it turned and turned. I saw that it did too. It turned away and started running off. As I got near my truck and began opening the door, I heard a whooshing noise and a bright light above the tree line. I drove off and got my two gears, got my gear two days later. Again, that's probably why people associate the Grafton monster with UFOs. Um, What was it? I I don't know. One teen in 1964 suggested that the creature was an escaped polar bear, but they investigated it and they couldn't figure out what or where a polar bear was doing in Grafton, West Virginia. 
The Grafton Sentinel posted on June 19th that the alleged monster was simply, quote, an individual who had been pushing a handcart lo- loaded with high, loaded high with boxes along Riverside Drive on Tuesday night. They said that due to the dim lighting and the wildly imaginative teens, the handcart was most likely the, the cause of the story and the sightings. They said it's fairly certain that monsters don't go around pushing handcarts loaded with boxes. Kurt here. Um, first of all, that's really all the info on the Grafton monster was never really seen again. Was it a handcart with boxes? Okay. If so, how did you get any of that description from that? I mean, people were all saying it was like muscly and it had seal fur and it was ginormous and it had no head. I've seen a handcart with boxes and I've never once gone like monster. Uh, was it a polar bear? Like in the TV show lost just wandering around West Virginia. I don't know. Was it an alien? Some people say, I don't know. Nobody knows what it is. Stop asking questions. I'm going to keep going because you're asking too many questions. So while talking about West Virginia, I could talk about bat boy, the infamous cryptid from the weekly world news, June 23rd, 1992 cover story, bat child found in cave because it's about West Virginia and about a cryptid. Uh, which I did buy back in the day. But um, even back then as a kid, I was like, oh, this shit's fake. Um, so let me just tell you this. As much as I want Bat Boy to re- be be real, Bat Boy is not real. I want Bat Boy to be real more than anything. It's a great story. It's a great cover to the magazine. It's the reason I bought the Weekly World News and got into weird shit. Not got into, but stayed into weird shit. But he's not real, so I'm not going to waste your time. Sadly, Bat Boy is the perfect legend that never happened, but still holds a place in my heart. So um, let's move around. Let's move on to other paranormal stuff that happens in Weva. Kurt here. Do people call it Weva? Because they should. It's West Virginia, Weva. You should call it Weva. Uh, let's go to the Wells Inn, where there isn't any cryptids, but there are some ghosts. That's right. Pivot. All right. The grandson of the founder of Sisterville's Sistersville. His name was Ephraim Wells. Well, he built a hotel to cater to oil barons and upper-class travelers in the late 1800s. Many say he's never left. That's right. Because a ghost walks the halls, turning on lights, slamming doors, moving objects, all the basic ghost stuff, and that many people have reported the sound of writing can be heard coming from Mr. Wells' old office. Again, I seriously can't imagine loving any job that much that I'm going to keep doing it even after I die. But hey, you know what? You do you, Mr. Wells. You do you. I don't, there's got to be a better afterlife than, well, you're just a ghost now, but you still got to do the stuff and still got to turn off the lights and, you know, make sure the hotel's running good. That's some bullshit. But that was just a teaser because there are many more ghost stories in West Virginia, and they'll all be told in the next already written episode of Paranormal Almanac. That's right, cliffhanger. Come back, same bat time, same bat boy time, same bat boy channel for the next episode. Paranormal ghost stories from West Virginia. Thank you all. Here be a bat boy.